Forgive me for reading. I'm always afraid I'm going to forget something. Um, so I'm Emily Hasty. Um, my work is in feminist historiography, film theory, television studies, a bit of a gamut. Um, but it's a great honor uh, for me to be able to introduce Jackie Stacy, whose work I really admire and whose generosity and kindness um, I am grateful for. Um, professionally, intellectually, and personally, I think she's a model feminist. Um, well, she's currently the director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research in the Arts and Languages at the University of Manchester. Jackie has worked in the interdisciplinary academic context of both women's studies and cultural studies for the last 20 years. Her research runs the gamut across forms from film, video, and contemporary art practices to medical technologies and subjects, which is a particularly apparent in her um, book titles and obviously book subjects, stargazing, female spectators in the Hollywood and Hollywood cinema, teratologies, a cultural study of cancer, and the cinematic life of the gene that came out a couple of years ago with Duke University Press. She's also co-edited three books, which further demonstrate her range of knowledge and expertise, Thinking Through the Skin with Sarah Ahmed, Queer Screens with Sarah Street, and writing otherwise, experiments in cultural criticism, Janet Wolf. Just as impressively, she is a longtime editor on the board of Screen, one of the most important and prestigious journals in cinema and media studies. So without further ado, here's Jackie in the flesh. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emily, for that generous introduction. And thank you for inviting me to speak at this celebration of the 21st anniversary of the Five College Women's Studies Research Center. And thanks to all those who worked alongside Karen Remler so hard to bring us all here today. I always think that the work of conference organization is a bit like housework. Most of the labor is invisible, often slightly tedious, and people only seem to notice when things haven't been done. <laughs> so warmest thanks to all of you from, from me for all your hard work. My time here at the centre was little short of idyllic. The peaceful setting, the assembled colleagues, the helpful librarians. On this 21st birthday, there is much upon which to congratulate the centre, its past and present directors and members and to think about what this anniversary event might mean. I wonder if it's less a coming of age and more an impressive marker of triumphant survival in a climate where budget cuts are ubiquitous. And it's important not to underestimate what such a scene of thriving intellectual and political commitment represent to those outside the centre as well as those within it. My talk tonight falls into two halves. It's a 40-minute talk. Uh, the first half, I'm responding to the title of the conference, which was quite a challenge. It's very broad um, and very expansive, but, uh, but very stimulating. So the first half of the talk, I'm responding to the conference title through, through my current work. And the second half of the talk takes three examples, uh, exemplified here. Some you may recognize, some not. Uh, it doesn't matter. I shall explain them all when we come to them. Um, so the second half of the talk takes those three examples to work through some of the issues I raise in the first half. So the title of this event pulls in many different directions and invites reflections upon the histories, theories, and politics of feminism. It challenges us to think about how we might conceive of the relationship between the cultural and the political and the place of each within the other. For me, the notion of mediating public spheres connects aesthetic forms to genres of political subjectivity. Lauren Ballant's term, the intimate public sphere, considers the production of the public sphere through the circulation of genres of the personal, the sexual, and the affective. This model highlights the affective dimensions of fantasies of citizenship which are integral to political struggle. By affect here, I'm referring loosely to the capacity to make an impression on others and vice versa, rather than concrete, uh, identifiable emotions and feelings as others have done. 
In thinking about the public sphere without an understanding of the effective pull of the political, I think feminism leaves behind not only important insights from psychoanalysis, but also from Marxist cultural theory, from the Frankfurt School to Raymond Williams and Stuart Hall. The title of this event connects the public sphere to questions of genealogies of feminist knowledge. This is an opportunity, then, to think about history and temporality, and to ask what are the limits of conventional ways of thinking about time in terms of a linear past, present, future genealogy? What are the problems with that? And how might we approach this question differently through recent feminist and queer work on temporality? One way into this question of mediated public spheres might be through what Lauren Blanc calls our historical present. Put simply, the present appears to us as historical when its particularities become most visible in those moments when we're unable to respond to it through our usual affective genres. This sense of the historical present as a temporality becomes most available to us, she argues, when it falls apart, when it fails to live up to its promise in which we had invested so much psychically and economically. But for Ballant, instead of the historical present becoming evident through exceptional moments, through the language of crisis and trauma, it reveals itself in the increasingly ordinary, ordinary experience of things falling apart. And we could all spend many hours finding examples that would fit this claim. It is the everyday failures of the multiple fantasies of a good life, up, upward mobility, reliable intimacy, political satisfaction, she argues, that require people to keep adjusting to the precariousness of the historical present. Adaptation, improvisation, and adjustment have become daily habits of even the more privileged amidst economic instability, she argues. A state of precarity thus defines the public sphere for Berlant. Finally responded. It was feeling neglected. Now it's come back to me. A state of precarity thus defines the current public sphere for Ballant. Focusing on, and I quote, I'm quoting from Cruel Optimism, focusing on the retraction of the social democratic promise of the post-Second World War period in the United States and Europe during the last three decades, Ballant argues that this historical moment is importantly, and I quote, as transnational as the circulation of capital, state liberalism, and the heterofamilial, upwardly mobile, good life fantasy have become. The stories that we tell about the place of feminism in this historical present are always political stories. Not just because feminism crosses political and intellectual boundaries, but because there's a politics to storytelling itself. How we imagine feminism to have transformed the public sphere depends upon the narrative shape we attribute to its history. So how should we best be attentive to the politics of the stories that we tell about feminism and the forms of repetition that shape the ways that narratives so quickly become conventionalized? In narrating the development of feminist theory, we tend to reproduce the orientating fictions of modern time, as if time simply flows from past to present to future. Our shorthand accounts of feminism and of feminist theory often rely on linear narratives with a cause and effect logic. There are often heroes and villains. The past is located in previous decades that are either nostalgically mourned or left behind with a sense of relief. Nostalgically mourned might be if only there were still consciousness raising groups, so much cheaper than therapy. <laughs> Left behind with a sense of relief might be, thank goodness we no longer have to wear dungarees to be feminists. Mine were large and lilac. <laughs> 
The problem, in short, is that feminism's progress narratives tell stories in ways that reinforce at the epistemological level the conservatism we seek to challenge at the political level. To avoid this, we might take our cue from Claire Hemmings in Why Stories Matter and pay better attention to the conventions of what she calls the political grammar of feminist storytelling. This would allow us to move outside the classic progress narrative, which finds in the 1970s a naive essentialism that, thank heavens, the social constructionism of the 1980s remedied, and leads to a more enlightened place of intersectional contingencies in the 1990s. For Hemings, this typical narrative is often accompanied by the current almost compulsory return to the earlier materialisms of a lost past. So how might we think differently about feminist genealogies beyond the idea of a direct line of descent from generation to generation and beyond the tales of progress, loss and return against which Hemings cautions so eloquently in Why Stories Matter? A different route through, avoiding the progress narrative, a different route through the question of feminist genealogies is offered by Robin Wiegman's recent book, Object Lessons. In this, she tracks what she calls the field imaginaries of identity knowledges. Identity knowledges of subjects such as women's studies, queer studies and race studies. Fields which are motivated by the political desire for social justice. Field imaginaries are defined by Wiegman as the affective force that constitutes the psychic life of the field or as she puts as a sort of shorthand, the disciplinary unconscious. Sidestepping the many foundational concepts of psychoanalysis and inventing her own vocabulary for the effective dynamics of political knowledge, Wiegmann's project nevertheless places centre stage a psychoanalytic approach to temporality. Here, in her work, time becomes non-linear, causation indirect, Desire often remains opaque. In this model, feminist genealogies might be thought of as circuitous instead of descendant, as assemblages instead of lineages, and as out of sync with time in the temporal drag through which Elizabeth Freeman approaches 1970s feminism. In her book, Time Binds. In the rest of this talk, I want to consider the problem of how to connect politics, knowledge and culture. Since a number of the concepts in the title of this conference, such as mediation, genealogy, the digital age, relate to questions of temporality, my talk tonight grapples with how to think differently about time and its affects when doing feminist and queer cultural studies. Here, I want to borrow on Anthony Vidler's idea of the warped spaces of modernity to think about warping time. To warp means to throw across, from the German werfen, to throw. For Vidler, warped spaces are haunted by the modern desire to make space transparent and legible. Warped time, I want to argue, is similarly bent, distorted, curved, twisted, scrambled. To explore this, I draw on three examples from my recent work from about, about art, cinema and live performance, respectively, to address the significance of cultural practices which warp time in different ways. I consider how and why the warping of time might help us reframe the temporality of the image and of the body and help us reflect on our current anxieties about their respective transparency and legibility. I pursue this in two ways. First, in relation to the changing status of the legibility of the image in the digital age, of destabilised authenticity, authorship and integrity. And secondly, in relation to the legibility of the body in the information age, the techno-scientific promise of transparency and genealogical certainty. My three examples are, first of all, Marcus Harvey's portrait of Margaret Thatcher, Maggie, in his 2009 show, White Riot. Secondly, 
Tilda Swinton as Ruby, the colour-coded cloned triplet in Lynn Hirschman Leeson's 2002 film Technolust. And thirdly, Peggy Shaw's performance of the live anatomy lesson Must, The Inside Story. So, for those of you that had a large dinner and maybe a couple of glasses of wine <laughs> and have sort of snoozed off by now, the rest of my talk runs from Maggie to Peggy, okay? <laughs> Maggie to Peggy, okay. So, part one, precarious publics. Bearing in mind Balant's argument that the current affective genre mediating the public sphere is precarity, I want to turn to my first example, Marcus Harvey's portrait, Maggie. My short reading will consider Maggie as an enactment of the precarious times of the mediated public sphere. And as you are about to see, Maggie's composition warps time through its use of space. When I first approached Maggie in the White Cube Gallery in London in 2009, I felt a rising sense of pleasure. Not, a, not an experience I usually associate with being close to Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> By moving around the exhibition space, I discovered that I had the power to change the form of Margaret Thatcher's presence. Viewed from the entrance, as uh, in the image in the PowerPoint, the portrait at first appeared to be a large-scale black-and-white reproduction of a close-up photograph of Thatcher as Prime Minister. But as I moved nearer, its photographic appearance fragmented into a densely populated high relief composed of thousands of plaster-cast objects, 15,000 to be precise. Protruding towards us as we approach her are a bizarre mixture of disproportionate vegetables, skulls, piles of coins, pointing fingers, missiles, phalluses, and cartoon masks of Tony Blair and Thatcher herself. <laughs> the phallic preponderance in this assemblage literalizes her famous preference for all male cabinets <laughs> and seems to mock seems to mock her claims to represent no-nonsense decency, traditional family values, and a return to Victorian sexual morality. But like the infamous femme fatale, Maggie has a formal duplicity. She looks like one thing, but turns out to be another. The portrait's compositional mutability then literally undoes the certainty of Thatcher's gaze in the photograph. Like the pixels of a digital image, the thousands of hidden units comprising the whole can be made to appear and disappear at any moment. Dissolving Maggie into fragment, fragments reconstitutes her through both the effects and the affects of her policies. I found myself seeking out the best position from which to exercise maximum control over her. The place where I could be the one who decided if she is an image in its totality or if she's fragmented into an eccentric collection of objects. In Maggie, then, Thatcher herself <coughs> is finally made precarious. As the centerpiece of White Riot, Maggie is placed Maggie is placed at the head of altered symbols of Britain's pathology of greatness, as Paul Gilroy calls it. That tendency um, in British culture to return to the Second World War as this sort of story of triumph in order to disavow its own violent colonial history. So here, Maggie is accompanied by three bronze statues in which military prowess is transformed, the Nike uh, statue on the left, Sporting greatness is deflated, the 1960s football that's kind of uh, um, not fully uh, inflated is sort of deflated and it's called Victoria. It refers back, of course, to Britain's 1960s World Cup glory that I shouldn't think many of you in this room remember. <laughs> and then finally, uh, the Lord High Admirable, uh, Admirable. <laughs> 
Yep, Freud would be proud. Uh, the Lord High Admiral, uh, in which national authority is desecrated. And here we have on Paul Gilroy's, on the cover of Paul Gilroy's book, the same statue of Churchill, which was uh, vandalized in, two th in 2000, in the 2000 um, May, May Day Parade. Uh, Churchill was given a turf Mohican. So read in this context, Maggie embodies the disintegration of Thatcherite versions of Britishness itself. My encounter with Maggie goes to the heart of our debate about mediated public spheres and genealogies of feminist knowledge at this conference. Here is the figure who most profoundly made the public sphere precarious and violated Britain's post-war social fabric and against whom feminists spent decades directing their campaigns about pay, about childcare, about abortion, about immigration laws, and about lesbian and gay rights. In Marcus Harvey's Maggie, then, we find Thatcher transformed into an assemblage that spatializes the time warps of, media of a mediated public sphere. And there is sweet revenge in turning the shattering impact of her policies back onto her status as an image of certainty. Two, reimagining re genealogy. I want to use the idea of the pixel as a unit of information, which I think is played with in Maggie, as a segue into my second example, which brings technoscience centre stage in the mediated public sphere. The pixel condenses temporal uncertainties, disturbs conventional genealogies, and interrupts relations of authenticity, authorship, and authority. If we now shift into the imaginative spaces which connect the so-called digital age to the so-called genetic one, we find here, too, a preoccupation with precarity. But this time, it is the foundational grand narratives of biology, reproduction, and kinship that are made precarious. The so-called digital age is one in which images and bodies can be broken down into small units of information. Be they pixels or genetic codes, these units promise to make life more transparent and legible, and yet often they do precisely the opposite, generating new biological <laughs> precarities. With this in mind, I want to turn to my second example, the film Technolust. Technolust is a witty art house pastiche of science fiction and film noir motifs, produced, written, and directed by Lynn Hirschman Leeson. In it, a successful genetic scientist, Rosetta Stone, I'll just pause while people get it, <laughs> downloads her own DNA to produce, okay, so the scientist is on the far left, downloads her own DNA to produce three sibling clones through whom she lives out the fantasies of a frustrated workaholic female academic. <laughs> Tilda Swinton plays all four parts, the scientist and the three color-coded clones. The clones are color-coded in such a way as to mark them out in a kind of comic book individuality. Ruby, the red one, Marine, the blue one, Olive, the green one. Shot on a 24-frame high-definition digital camera and later transferred to film, the vivid, largely primary colour aesthetic of Technolust has a kind of hyper-real sensibility in which the boundaries between the real and the virtual become increasingly confused. These three clones are housed in Rosetta's secret basement, but in order to survive, the clones <coughs> need regular intake of semen to top up their constantly depleting levels of Y chromosomes. <laughs> the semen, they inject, they both inject and they drink as a kind of infusion, like afternoon tea. <laughs> to retrieve the necessary semen, Ruby becomes a kind of femme fatale, who seduces random men by citing lines from old 1950s Hollywood movies. These films are screened uh, across her body at night to program her in the motivations of heterosexual femininity, though there's something decidedly queer-looking about the whole arrangement. 
I want to show you a clip um, from uh, towards the beginning of Technolust, showing these screenings.
Okay. So Ruby's uh, sperm retrieval outings then uh, in these um, seductions of, of random men, she uses these lines like, don't ever let the celebration end. And uh, she goes and whispers them into random men's ears and they follow her, not surprisingly, because she's Tilda Swinton. Um, she, could, she could be whispering anything, quite frankly. So Techno Lust offers a kind of tongue-in-cheek narrative about the mobility and mutability of informational matter that flow between human bodies and artificial life forms and between the cinema and computer screens. Here we move into a fantasy world of techno-scientific multiplicities where the convergence between digital and genetic sampling and manipulation enables the reconfiguration of procreation, parenthood, authorship and origin stories. In their warping of time and genealogy, the digitised images and the geneticised bodies destabilise the knowledge that they promise to anchor. In these cultures of imitation, copying and citation, originals are harder to verify, authenticity harder to determine, and authorship, even of oneself, is harder to ascertain. Three, queer bodies. I now move into the final section of my paper, which continues to think about the medical, about, sorry, about the mediated public sphere in terms of science and the cinema, but shifts to reading the live body on the stage. This time, the medical gaze is the focus of the desire for transparency and legibility in a world characterised by opacity and multiplicity. Must, the inside story, is a collaborative performance between Claude Ensemble and Peggy Shaw of Split Britches. Described by its creators as a poetic look at what it feels like to have a body, Must comprises 11 short monologues which use the first person but undercut our expectations of any straightforwardly biographical conf autobiographical confession turning the stage into an anatomy theatre and the audience into her students, Shaw narrates her own medical history through shifting generic registers that move us from family sagas to sexual histories to Hollywood cinema, poetic remembrance, and into magnified microscopic medical images of the inside of the body. Shaw's biographical anatomy lesson is accompanied by live music of Claude Ensemble and back projected images of microscopic enlargements of the human body from the Welcome Medical Slide Library and extracts from early animation films accompany and are sometimes screened across Shaw's live body on stage. And I'm going to show you a very short two minute clip uh, which Claude and Peggy Shaw uh, gave me permission to show. Um, and then talk more about the performance. went to sleep. <laughs> hey, you want to see my body? <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, 65 years old and I'm lucky. I got both my breasts still safe inside my suit. My uh, upper arms are big because my dad said life is hard and you gotta lift your weight every day before you go to school. <laughs> my left wing is a little higher than my right one. You probably noticed that right away. It <laughs> kind of droops. I was holding my clavicles are the sexiest part of my body. There's a photograph from recorded on a cell phone somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I can't lie down to the exam because I feel like I'm going to die. I'm scared to expose the front of my chest without my arms covering them. 
I feel foolish in your room, like a, like an Elijah's room, like a bull in a china shop. Can you, can you smell the years of sun on my skin and I can talk like an elephant's time? Or are you too busy thinking I look like Marilyn Monroe? <laughs> when faced with two choices, it's no surprise to make the wrong one. <laughs> I have two keys in my key ring. I get the wrong key every time. That's why I don't gamble. Mm -hmm. The reason I get mistaken for a man is my neck. My arms up is what's throwing you off. My arms up combined with my suit and my tie is confusing. <laughs> My thyroid cartilage and my cricoid cartilage combine to challenge you. I've been 13 bodies in my life. This is only one of them. Thank you. The question, would you like to see my body, with, with which the extract begins, cites the masculine curiosity and feminine display that feminists have argued characterise the history of both science and the cinema. In Must, curiosity and display are combined and relocated in the enigmatic promise of Peggy Shaw's noirish butch persona. In 1940s and 1950s film noir, the male protagonist is a figure on the wrong side of time. His retrospective narrations usually reveal that hindsight came too late. What all noir protagonists badly needed was more insight much earlier in the game. <laughs> but they got distracted by the charms of the evil femme fatale. Think Fred McMurray as Walter Neff in Double Indemnity. I killed him for the money and a woman. I didn't get the money and I didn't get the woman. Shaw employs a kind of noirish retrospective knowingness in Must to turn autobiographical revelation into a seductive refusal of gender legibility. Her roguish, her roguish butch noir commentary combines with a kind of anticipatory mode of dialogue with the audience about how they might be reading her live body on stage. She becomes the master of time playing with its scales and warping its smooth transitions to tell her inside story. A couple of hundred million years ago, before you were born, my body was joined together to form one land mass. Slowly, my 12 plates started moving away from each other. Can you hear all my bones fitting together as I keep living? Turning voyeuristic desires towards the butch body back on themselves, she performs her anatomy lessons through an intimate knowledge of the codes which work to depersonalize her own story, even as we invest it with the thrill of her live confessions. Must moves us into an affecting narration of the vulnerability of the queer body, its desires and its diseases, its abnormal growths and its injuries, its treatments and its surgeries, its birthing and its aging. Anticipating readings that will have been made of her, or will have been made of her body by the audience, Shaw's inside story both maps her vulnerability and apparently masters time by articulating so poetically the future that others might have imagined for her. This paradox might be summed up as the having already been readness of queer's future perfect. We could rehearse this in the following way. My vulnerability rests on your capacity to wound me and vice versa, but my queerness defies this wounding power since it has already embraced and incorporated your derision. Thus, you read me, I show I've read your reading by, by reclaiming it, and in reading myself by refusing your reading of me. I know that I'll get ahead of the game, only to find that I will have been read by you 
if I arrive in your future. These acts of reading and being read and of one's having already been readness of the queer future perfect become part of the queerness of the performance itself in terms of the lesbian butch as noir hero, performing what we might call the asynchronicity of queer's temporal presence. To quote Lee Edelman, we are never at one with our queerness, neither its time nor its subject are ours. Instead, he points to the queerness of time's refusal to submit to a temporal logic. Must, I think, makes this refusal of a temporal logic into a queer matter. This is a story about time, about coming from the darkness to the light. I always thought time started when I was born and ended when I died. Didn't you? But it all started a long time ago in black and white. And now it's a fact of life. There's no logic in here. No beginning, middle, or end. Okay, so to conclude. To conclude, I want to make five propositions that might help guide us in our discussions at this conference. First, I want to suggest that the mediated public sphere is one made precarious by both the accelerated instabilities of transnational economic cultures and the time warps of digital and genetic manipulation. Second, that we live this precarity intimately and effectively through our psyches and our bodies in ways that require we invest in the future, the promise of the good life ahead, through genres of constant adaptation and adjustment, as Lauren Ballant has put it. Thirdly, that feminist genealogies might avoid tidy political grammars or transparent visions by reading instead the time warps of the circuitous desires that psychoanalysis takes as its starting point. Fourth, I just have to find fourth. Fourth, that the queerness of time, as Edelman puts it, time's refusal to submit to a temporal logic, currently marks digital and geneticized cultures as manifested in anxieties about a loss of authenticity and singularity of both the body and the image. And finally, running through all the above is the continued importance, I think, of cultural form, genres, styles, icons, narratives, in understanding the effective pull of political imperatives as they reach into the spaces of our intimate publics. And if all this seems too dense and you just feel it's too late in the evening to take it all in, <laughs> I leave you instead with three figures. Maggie and her instability as a legible image as we move in and out of her symptomatic precarity. Ruby as, cloned as Ruby's cloned bodily absorption of the heterosexual desires of Hollywood heroines to sustain a kinship driven by the time warps of the digital as they become the biological. And Peggy Shaw's butch noir narratives of her 13 bodies that pastiche 1940s masculinity in order to speak back to the desire to know the body intimately by making it transparent. I leave you with these impressions of three mediated time warps, Maggie, Ruby and Peggy, and hope that they might help us imagine genealogies of feminist knowledge in the digital age differently. Thank you. So rather than Maggie, Ruby, and Peggy, I'm kind of going to give you more Jackie, Jackie, Jackie. So, um, uh, so I look forward to uh, a lively conversation, I trust, about Jackie's presentation. So I'm going to make my initial um, response relatively brief. Um, 
So I first encountered Jackie's work in Star Studies, her early essay on Desperately Seeking Susan is keenly insightful on identification and desire. Um, remember it, like, fairly clearly to this, I know, so old, I know, but it's so good. Um, but it's teratologies that has had the most recent impact on my own work, um, both because of its own um, object of study and its diverse methodological approach, teratologies greatly informed um, my writing practice about my own medical narrative um, itself, which was intertwined with an analysis of television's diagnostic practices, which you kindly read for me. Um, one of the elements of Jackie's book that I found most illuminating was her emphasis on narrative. So the very first line is, books about cancer always tell stories. Her own book goes on to interrogate those stories, set in self-help literature, in biographies, in film, and medical imagery, through close textual analysis set within broader cultural narratives, much like we saw here. Um, methodologically, she leans into the stories, bringing her own body with her, and therefore her own stories as well. So she considered, um, in teratologies, how trauma both incites the repetition of medical narratives and prevents their complete telling. Um, here in that book, of course, she connects narrative, memory, and history, and approach, which we also saw in her talk today, and one that, um, that is also you know, very informative for me. The clear pivot, though, between teratologies and her talk today is her most recent book, The Cinematic Life of the Gene, which so beautifully examines medicalized, mechanized, and monstrous bodies and film and genetic engineering. As she described um, Marcus Harvey's Maggie, and now I'm having some sort of time warp because I've read this before, so I, but I'm acting like I was thinking of it today, um, in this moment. So as she described Marcus Harvey's Maggie, um, I couldn't help but turn back to her analysis of the credit sequence of Alien Resurrection. Um, and there, you know, it's, it's that sequence is not made up of an array of objects, of skulls, of fingers, of vegetables. I particularly liked the cauliflower um, in that. Um, what we see on the screen are cells. Um, and here are Jackie's own words about the sequence. The mesmerizing credit sequence shows cellular mutations in flowing motion. Shot in close up, the warm glow of the golden color. It's reflective, shiny, something sticky, somewhat sticky surface, and the repeated use of circulate interconnected patterns give a honeycomb look to the substance. But a much more sinister set of associations governs this sequence as almost immediately cells mutate into more monstrous distortions. The waves of the flowing cells are accompanied by an eerie musical score that rises and falls to the same rhythmic pattern. A bodily form emerges as the moving contours begin to resemble mutating versions of skin, flesh, and bones. And I read that for a couple of reasons. One, because I kind of love dramatic readings of theoretical work. Um, and, uh, and secondly, um, uh, because I think it gives you a sense of how her words, her written words in this case, are able to communicate such um, incredible visual detail. So she goes on in her work, work in this incisive vein, revealing the increasingly recognizable monsters emerging out of this mass of cells, this mutating stream of images. Um, and as with her edited anthology, Thinking Through the Skin, and she in which her co-editor call for a methodological approach that is essentially born of the skin, a skin-type politics, they say, and this is quoting, that takes as its orientation not the body as such, but the fleshy interface between bodies and worlds. Thinking through the skin is a thinking that reflects, not on the body as the lost object of thought, but on inter-embodiment, on the mode of being with and being for, where one touches and is touched by others. To me, that description matches Jackie's own work. In her presentation tonight, Jackie has continued to think through bodies of art, of feminists, of genealogies, but she has also shown how genealogies linked to histories, to stories, and to biological cells are potentially messy things. Um, and it's in that warped state that she invites us to read them, 